It's a pretty good zoo, said young Gerald McGrew, and the fellow who runs it seems proud of it, too. But if I ran the zoo, said young Gerald McGrew, out of a few changes, that's just what I'd do. The lions and tigers and that kind of stuff they have here now are not quite good enough. You see things like these in just any old zoo. They're awfully old-fashioned. I want something new. So I'd open each cage, I'd unlock every pen, I'd let the animals go and start over again. And somehow or other, I think I could find some beasts of a much more unusual kind. My new zoo will make people talk. My new zoo will make people gawk at the strangest odd creatures that ever did walk. That was an excerpt from If I Ran the Zoo by Dr. Seuss. And it was one of my, by far, one of my favorite books growing up. It was the idea that you have complete artistic ownership of the environment and you get to create whatever you want. And that's something that has always been really fond of mine, right? And I think that's one of the reasons why um, I'm a content creator. It's one of the reasons why I'm a business owner is because I can really have a lot of ownership in what I do. So today I'm going to pretend like I'm the director of the CrossFit Games. And I'm going to tell you a thing or two about if I ran the zoo. The fitness movement is brought to you by Zor Fitness. We offer coaching and individualized program design, as well as educational content for coaches and athletes. It's all at one place, ZorFitness.com. To be clear, if I ran the zoo, I wouldn't just open the cages and let the animals run around like it says in the story. We already have a lot of incredible athletes in our sports, and we need to be able to put them on display to a better degree. Additionally, to be clear, I think that there's a lot more good than bad that's going on in the way that CrossFit just does things as a whole, in my opinion. That's why I own a CrossFit affiliate. That's why I own a coaching company that specializes in CrossFit athletes. I want to do constantly varied functional movements performed at high intensity. Uh, I believe in that ethos, but at the same time, if I ran the zoo, there would definitely be some things that would be executed on differently or things that I would obviously be changing. And these things largely surround uh, programming for the game season and other CrossFit licensed events, and then prioritizing athlete safety and just the growth of the sport as a whole. So the biggest overarching theme here would be around changes to the rule book, the standards, and the, the judging best practices and how they're, they're instituted currently. One change for me right away, if I ran the zoo, would be movement standards would be released in the rule book, including any ones that have historically been tested, right? So like these are all the things that we think of traditionally, like when we think of CrossFit movements. And then B, so anything that we've seen before, and then B, anything that could be potentially new, and they're not allowed to test anything that is not in the rule book. So this could be a pretty exhaustive list, and there could be a lot of things that uh, encompass that. Like ideally, it'd probably be like a list of like maybe 25 to 50 items of different movements and the way that they would be standardized, the way that they are standardized, and that is not allowed to change for at least that particular season. So it's at least saying like, hey, this is a handstand push-up. This is what the movement standards are for a handstand push-up. And we're going to hold this across all levels of competition. And if there's different variations of this, these are the standards for those being very clear, very direct. And that way we're not having five different handstand push-up variations across five different years of the open. Um, that kind of stuff definitely needs to change. So this means that there cannot be a movement that shows up in the game season at any point or any CrossFit licensed event that isn't from that rule book, right? And certainly people who are working as CrossFit licensed events should have some input into this. They could be on a board as well that have, uh, again, are going to be able to speak into uh, the leadership as CrossFit as well. That's something that they would 100% uh, need to be open to and that if I was running it, I would be open to. Furthermore, this would mean that the judges course would include all of those historically tested items as well as all of those new movements that haven't come out yet, but could come out and have those standards around them. And that way, anyone who is a certified judge doesn't just have experience for the movements that have come out in the past that everybody knows, but also they have experience seeing what it looks like to actually do these new movements from real demo athletes who are actually at the caliber and speed of contraction that we see uh, high level athletes performing them. And that way the, the judging can be elevated and also just like be prepared, frankly. And then I would say like, ideally, this would be something where it could lead into like a press conference held by like the PFFA or something similar to that, right? Where it would basically allow 
of the athletes or representatives of the athletes to get together and ask clarifications or bring up like safety concerns and that sort of thing. And that way there's a little bit more of a dialogue and also you can create some like hype around uh, like the, the new things that could potentially be in the rule book. You know, this is an LSIT. This is how it's standardized. Um, those sorts of things like, okay, we haven't seen this variation or this particular kind of movement before. This is how we're standardizing it for this year. These are the points of performance that you, we are looking for from a judging perspective. And this is what needs to be met. This is a good rep. This is a bad rep. Uh, just being very, very clear about that whole process. Again, to be clear, this doesn't mean that the movements have to be tested that are the, the new items, right? It's just saying that this is a pool that we could potentially draw from. We could maybe use you know, several of these, we could use none of these, but we certainly won't use all of them, right? And ideally, I would say, again, this is maybe in the 25 to 50 movement range that allows things to keep quite broad. If people focus on those too much, and this will be something that people would figure out very quickly if I ran the zoo, it would be like, if we focus on these items too much, it's just going to draw away from like getting really good and having uh, the, the, the known testing body of the sports in terms of like the historically tested movements. If those aren't up to, to par, because that's always going to be the thing that is the vast majority of what needs to be programmed. And I would uh, also hold to that is like, okay, we will introduce some of these movements as a way to see who's been brushing up on those other items and continue to push the entire community forward. Cause I think that's a very important effect that the games has on the entire CrossFit community, but leveraging that in a way that's a little bit more systematic and allows people to um, also, again, create a little bit more hype around uh, particular movements that are could potentially appear in the game season. So that's largely about like the rule book and movements and judging best practices. I would also mandate that all the stages in the CrossFit game season, as well as any CrossFit licensed event, is required to release the events in their entirety at least two weeks before the events with complete events briefings for those events that allow athletes to dialogue and have themselves or their coaches like ask questions about the events. And that way you're not only saving time because you won't have to do a detailed briefing at the event itself, but then it also allows judges, coaches, and athletes to be much more prepared for what they're actually being tested in and what is going to be expected of them when they actually go to execute the movements at full speed. So that first point had a lot around it. It's just kind of a lot of meat on the bone, a bunch of different things that were kind of moving there. The second piece is very simple in terms of like how I would change some things. And that I was, I would always be biasing the racing side of the sport, meaning that I would emphasize the visual aspect of uh, the programming. I would uh, emphasize the fact that this is not just something that athletes can slog their way through, but they're actually able to create tight races and you know, head to head jockeying, things like that, that are going to allow a good spectacle of a sporting event, like any other event that you see that is a racing sport, because CrossFit is a racing sport, and you need to put that on display. That's what's going to allow people to uh, see the races actually play out. And that would be something that would be at the forefront of my thought process as I'm actually writing the events is how are these going to look, not just what are we testing for. And while that's pretty simple and straightforward, it would have a lot of implications to it. The one thing that I'll continue to say is that there would still be a balanced testing body in the fact that there would be a balance of things like gymnastics, structural weightlifting. There'd be a balance of time domains, things that we typically are wanting to see in CrossFit competitions. Those things would be preserved. It would just be the fact that we're not trying to create so much separation amongst the field that we lose the racing aspect of the sport. There's going to be still be events that are bottleneck that are going to require that sort of separation, but you can do that in a way where the spectacle isn't lost. And I think that's the important part of this. My third and final more major change that I would make would be in regards to the movement selection that we're seeing. So we have a, a history in the sport of we expect to see certain movements appear at different uh, stage of the season. We expect them to be in certain volume ranges. There's a lot of things that we expect, even if that's not guaranteed to us, because it's certainly not guaranteed to us because it's always, yeah, constantly varied, as we said before. But I think while you're in that constantly varied vein, that's the way that you go about that will change as the person who's leading the programming changes. So if we see more high school gymnastics out of Adrian Bosman, we're going to see coaches and affiliates program more high level gymnastics scuff and other uh, skill work underneath that, that's going to allow athletes to continue to progress in that way. So there's this very clear trickle down effect from the games to the rest of the community. And I think that people really try to separate those two, like the games is one thing, the methodology is something else, right? The sport versus the methodology. And while that's true for the average person, they don't understand that first of all. And then there's also this very important symbiotic relationship, meaning that 
the, the two entities benefit off each other, right? They feed off each other and they help each other out. And without either of those aspects, I think the other one would either die or wither very badly. So I think a good illustration would be like, we see crossovers with a jump rope at the CrossFit games. Now the following year, we see all of these affiliates who are now programming crossovers into the programming. Why? Because we see the best athletes do it. And we want to emulate that to a certain degree in our average population. Like it or hate it, that's the reality of what we have going on. And I don't think that's going to change in the next several decades, unless there's some big overhauls in the way that CrossFit does things. And I don't necessarily think that's what you want either. I think you want to take advantage of that to the highest degree possible. And then also just like be much more conscious when you're programming for the best of the best, how that is going to have inevitably have a trickle down effect to the average member at the average affiliate. So with all of that as a caveat, I want to say that there'd be certain things I would change. For example, there would just be less instances of kipping movements across the board. Why? Because it's like, I want to maintain the health and safety of the athletes who are actually participating in the sport. And then, as I said, it's going to have a trickle down to all the affiliates. And it's only going to be helpful to the longevity of the sport, uh, the way that it's just viewed by the average person who comes across it online, if we have less kipping movements. If I was running it, I wouldn't pull them out entirely and I wouldn't make that public. I would just shift the way that the programming is done to a large degree. And people just realize like, oh, kipping was way more popular like a decade ago. And now it's like, yeah, it's, you still do it, but it's like not as much of an important aspect of the sport as it once was. And that's the sort of thing that I think would be important. It's like, okay, this is a variation that we can do. It still has utility. There's certain uh, arguments that can certainly be made for kipping movements. And I think all of those things are well and good and fine. But that's just not going to be like the the biggest front facing thing that you see from the CrossFit community and certainly not from the CrossFit games. So if that's the paradigm we're using, like we're thinking safety first, we're going to move more towards uh, strict pull up variations, more towards strict handstand push up variations. And then there's certainly other aspects of the testing body that could be more like core to extremity type pulling capacity, which Again, with something like a kipping pull-up could be testing. A pegboard, you're still going to be able to use your legs, right? Not that we couldn't use a strict variation, but things like that, things like rope climbs with legs, uh, hand-over-hand sled pulls where you're able to use your hips, things like that are going to be able to test similar qualities for the movement with just a little bit less uh, risk for the trickle-down effect for the rest of the population. So even if the, the games athletes can perform butterfly kipping chest bars really efficiently and smoothly and cleanly. And that's not really an issue for their joints and longevity of their career. I would argue that probably is for a good chunk of the people who are doing them at your average affiliate. And that is the reason why you'd pull it a little bit more out of the top aspect of the sport. And I would make sure that you preserve some of those same qualities. So like you're seeing the beat kip in something like a toes to bar or like a, a kipping bar muscle up, for example. And I don't think all those things need to go away, as I said before, but just minimizing the amount that you're actually seeing those things like box jumps. Why do we need to be doing rebounding box jumps or at least how, why do we need to be having formats of workouts that encourage rebounding box jumps from an average member? There might be certain instances of workouts where if you were just a really high level athlete, like you might be able to rebound 30 inch box jump overs, but the average member isn't going to do that. So it encourages them to step down or at least not to rebound those reps. So there, again, there'd be certain things where I think it could be mandated like, okay, we're requiring a box jump step down on this workout across the board with the movement standard. However, I think there's other instances where if you try to put that in place, it's going to inhibit the race that takes place at the high level events. So just being very aware of when you program those and when you need to mandate a step down to ensure the safety of the population or the athletes doing it. And then again, the trickle down effect to the rest of the population, things like that, that are going to allow athletes in the sport to have a longer, healthier career. And then to the average member is also just going to have a better demonstration of what it means to be a high level athlete in our sport and what health means in our community. But that's how I would make some changes if I ran the zoo. Thanks for listening today. If you're someone who just started listening to the show, I would encourage you to subscribe so you can stay up to date. If you're someone who's been listening for a while, I would encourage you to rate and review the show. And lastly, the best thing that you can do to support our work is also the best thing that you can do for your performance. And that is by hiring one of our coaches. Until next time, stay the course.